We'll go three, two, and one. All right, welcome back to another episode of Persuasion by the Pint. I'm Jonathan Taylor, along with Sean McCool. And Jonathan, today we have a special guest waiting in the green room. We're going to be talking about online courses and why you should have a really good one. Yes. How, how they can help persuade your clients to do even more business with you. Mm -hmm. And lots of other things that we don't really know what the, our guest is going to say. So, um, I'm looking yeah. forward to this one. Like, yeah, it's a little bit different. It's kind of, you know, we talk a lot about acquisition and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So to kind of hit the back end of stuff, cause that's really where, you know, your best customers and all that come after the first purchase, right? It's where lifetime. Value that's right. <clears throat> And you and I, over the years, we've we've gone through a lot of courses. We sure. spent a few bucks on courses. Yeah, we spent just a few a few shekels here and I there. I think between courses and Apple, that's probably yeah. where most of my money has gone <laughs> in the last twenty years. That's right. So, so I'm interested in in the year 2024. What uh, what is different about creating the not only the demand, the persuasiveness. Uh, yeah, and, the, you know, and the, the experience, right? We've talked about yeah. experience before. Like, what's the experience like now? Yeah. You know? So how do you how, how do you how do you change that? Because I mean, I've I've been on some courses lately, and they look like they were still made back in you know two thousand and five. You know, or with the, the Netscape waiters. browser. <laughs> it's like, okay, how many hoops do I have to go through to just watch a video? Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting. You know, I don't know. I, I know you want to make, you want to build intrigue. Yeah. You want to build, you want to build, um, I'm sure there's a lot of scarcity that's probably used. I mean, we'll talk to Rachel about this. I guess but, we're going to find out, aren't we? Um, yeah. But so yeah. Wanna, instead of guessing, we should just bring, <laughs> bring our guest on. Let me, let me read the bio, the official okay. bio. That yes. She sent me. Let's start there. Um, and then we'll get into all right. Some backstory of how I met Rachel and all that kind of stuff. So yes, okay, her name cool. is Rachel Kraft. She's a marketer, writer, and instructional designer based out of New Jersey. She works with thought leaders, including well-known keynote speakers and best-selling authors. I guess we're not naming names. Uh, <laughs> to build instructional content and marketing assets that make a difference. Rachel has a master's degree in education, years in the trenches as a professional educator, and more than a decade working as a copywriter and marketer. Now she helps clients bridge the gap between their groundbreaking ideas and a willing audience who is eager to buy. So welcome to the show, Rachel Kraft. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Did you get that kind of applause in the classroom? That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> no golf claps on this show. We give no. full applause. Full yeah, you, you were just missing the little animation of people cheering, popping up. Oh, that's in the a, that's of the a good idea. We'll work on that for next time. <laughs> I don't know what happened to your uh, video, Jonathan, but it just turned into an image. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me fix that real quick because I just got an icon in front of me. Yeah, that's... I mean, it is an improvement. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let's All see. right, well, we'll edit this out for the, the podcast version. There we go. Maybe. All right. All right. There you are. Back. All right. Back. Yeah. So Rachel, welcome. How did, how long ago did, did you and I first meet? It's been what? It's been at, least 10, at least 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was uh, 2014 at a conference yeah. down in Florida. And wow. uh, I mean, that's when we met in person. I think we were working together on some projects mm -hmm. maybe a year or two before that. Um, I think you had hired me for some things. Yeah, I think back then you were doing like some research for mm -hmm. me when I would do a big project. I would give you this stuff and you'd go out and do all the hard work, <laughs> um, <laughs> do all the research. And then I just cherry picked what you gave me, which was amazing. It was awesome. Um, use that education background and master's degree skills to, to find all kinds of good stuff um, in the Googles and other places. So. Yeah, yeah, that was good. And I guess it was at an AWAI then, is that right? Yeah. It was, okay. yeah. I was in my walking yeah. cast and uh, yeah. you were on stage that year presenting yeah. your story. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. And, I, cool. and then I, I met your sister, mm -hmm. Trish, at, I think I first met her at a Dan Kennedy event. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. So the one, I think in the one in Nashville, I think actually. So, so yeah, the whole family. So <laughs> I have to have, I don't know what she's up to. Maybe we'll have her on if she's still in the business. I don't know. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's have, let's first, before we get into, give us one like fascination bullet teaser type bullet about what something you're going to say today. Like don't give away too much. Keep them hanging on. That's right. Oh my goodness. Um, Put you on the spot. There's a huge opportunity in online courses and more than three out of four businesses are now using it in some manner. So we can Mm -hmm. talk about the different ways that businesses are using the online courses, but it's just something that's growing in a huge, huge way. So there's a lot of opportunity. That's interesting because I, I think with, with a lot of the people who might listen to this show, direct response, you know, coaches, copywriters, um, you know, small business, they might think that's a saturated market. Mm-hmm. You're saying it's not, right? I am. Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll we'll come back to that. So <laughs> I want to uh, know what courses are people really hooked on? Like, what is the interest? We'll get to that. I know. I know. But we got to do our juvenile beer talk first. <laughs> <laughs> I so Ra- Rachel, about 200 episodes ago, somebody said <clears throat> our beer talk was juvenile. So that's now the segment name. Oh, no. Juvenile beer talk. Right. So, so uh, what kind of beer do you have today? I already know, but. I'll yeah. Pretend. So, you know, it's funny that you say juvenile because my very first experience with beer was as a juvenile. Oh. Um, I, I feel nice. like I need to share this story with you guys. When I was. A little little kid like four or five years old we used to go camping with a group my dad was a vet and there was this whole group of, of veterans that would go camping with their families and they would have a keg so the kids job was to take the beer mug up to the keg and refill it of course it was you know 75 percent buzz <laughs> and then liquid at the very bottom but that was my first experience you know just drinking uh, all the suds off the top. So I guess I could say I developed a taste for beer very young. Wow. Nice. But, so uh, <laughs> your parents were either Gen X or boomers. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a Trogues Sunshine Pilsner. <clears throat> yeah. There we go. So yeah. I am from uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania area. And this is a local brewing company that... Um, Actually, a friend of mine is good friends with the owners of the company, and they started off with a small brewery in Harrisburg, and then they expanded, and they have this huge facility right outside of Hershey Park. So it's a, a fun place to go, and yeah, lots of different flavors. They're really expanding. So that's do they I ever do any that. like um, cross promotion with Hershey, like uh, Hershey Milk Stout or anything like that? Or I don't know. Actually, It'd that be cool would if they be, did. Yeah, that would be delicious. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not aware of one. I have to tell you, um, I lived in Harrisburg in 98, seven, let's see, got out in 95. So 96, maybe oh, okay. seven during the blizzard that came through that oh, year. Yeah. And we promptly left when that came <laughs> as soon as, so we were there when the, the bridge that goes across the baseball Island, when it came, went down with the oh. ice, the ice dam and all that. And then we got flooded out of our apartment because the river flooded and like, mm-hmm. yeah. So we left after that, went South. Haven't been back North since. Well, we went to Baltimore for a year, but other than that. So, right. so yeah. We went uh, to a yeah. wedding up in Harrisburg. Harrisburg this was yeah. about I think <clears throat> everybody's years ago. been through Harrisburg. It seems yeah. like it's like one of those cities, even though it's not that big, it's like a major like through route. If you're in the Northeast yep. for sure. Yeah. Uh, we had to go to the uh, Hershey uh, factory that was that was on the agenda. Mm-hmm. So that was um, cool. my wife has corrected me and it said it was 1996. She's <laughs> <Just laughs> terrible with <laughs> so. All right, <laughs> we're always terrible with dates, right? I mean, it's yeah. Like, yeah, whatever. It's somewhere around there. It's good to have a uh, a monitor built into your show here. <laughs> um, all right, <laughs> fact check. All right, so we have our own fact checkers on the yes. show. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, what are you having today? All right, so I've got a Willetized. Uh, this is from uh, Ling- uh, Linguitas. Um, There's an so, N in there somewhere, man. Uh, huh? Lingina, yeah, I can't say it. Linguitas, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a coffee stout, 100% barrel aged. 
Zero nice. percent uh, stainless, uh, brewed using every highly roasted malt we could get our hands on, and oh. some coffee uh, oh. from the buds at Chicago's own Metropolis Coffee, mm. aged in bourbon, bourbon and rye barrels. Ugh, I don't know about the rye barrels, but uh, it's from our their friends at Willet Distillery. Don't know where Willet is. Is that here? But, Will it? Will it? That's, oh, no, Bullet is here. I don't think Will it is here. Yeah. It's a chocolate coffee, smoky, bourbony, beast of a barrel age. This thing is 12.4, 12. 12.4%. 12. <laughs> and I got two sitting on deck. I mean, well, w- one other sitting on deck. So. Yeah. Rachel, you may be running the show today. Seems <laughs> <laughs> that way. All right. Well, I have on on my end. Uh, let me see if I can find a. I couldn't find a picture because it's an old uh, stout, but I've got a can here. So, mine is Funk Metal. <laughs> That's cool from, art. Yeah. Let me see that um, art again. That is awesome. Yeah, Funk Metal from Jester King Brewery. Jester King Brewery is here. Just, it's about twenty minutes. On the west of here, my wife will correct yep. me if that's not right. <laughs> um, Fact checkers, <laughs> and it's like a farm to table brewery. Like they actually harvest their own yeast from the like the wind, and like have a barn, and it goes in and catches on a screen, and the whole bit. Like it's it's pretty pretty Austiny. Um, so I am. So what this is? It's a sour barrel aged stout. And you know Ew. when you're when you're 350 <laughs> episodes in and you're looking for new beers, sometimes they get weird. So this one, I don't know, I don't know how it's gonna be. I pulled up, I couldn't find a picture, so I pulled up um, somebody else's review of it, and here's what they said: the nose shows a great balance between rich sweetness and fruity funk. I'm picking up on aromas of tannic red wine, milk chocolate, black cherry, old leather. Dates, yeah. sweet caramel, sharp oak, burnt toast, and jammy raspberry. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I don't know if I want to drink that yeah, or not. Yeah. So uh, anyway, we'll see. Combinations. So, but uh, yeah, so let's uh, let's cheers it up and then sip and then rate and then we'll jump in. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh. Oh, and that is, let's see. Rich sweetness and fruity funk. Okay. I'm not really, I don't know what fruity funk tastes like. I know what funky fruit tastes like, which is not good. But I'm not sure about fruity funk. So, um, so Rachel, we let our guests go first. You've had that one before, but what's your, what's your take on it? I haven't. Maybe you haven't. <clears throat> no, oh, you haven't. Yeah. So it's a little bit more bitter than I would care for. Okay. I for something that's just a little more smooth, mellow tasting. Oh, so you're, kind of, has, you're our kind of beer drinker. I like that. Yeah, it has a little bit of a tang to it, just like a little bit of a yeah. okay. So what, what's the scale that we're doing? We do one, one to five. five pints. You can use as many decimals <clears throat> as you want. One, one decimal, five. as many points afterward the decimal as you want. All right. I feel bad because it's a local brewery and I know their other beer is very good, but I'm going to give this a two. Point three, two. Wow. Tough, tough not, judge not here. Man. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's but their other stuff was very good. Yeah. I should have gotten one that I that I knew well. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, you got to live and learn, right? Yeah. So, Jonathan, you're halfway done with that one. How is it? <laughs> Four oh, wow. point nine. It, it, like he's already. <laughs> <finished it. laughs> this is good. It is really good. Oh, wow. I mean, I was expecting it to be a little too um, sweet and syrupy yeah. for the uh, especially twelve percent. Yeah, yeah, but it's not. It's it's really good. Yeah, you start getting into like almost a liqueur at that mm-hmm. point. You know, when you when you're that that stage. not this one, not this one. Um, cool. Wow, I might have to check that one out. Yeah. Well, mine is very interesting. It definitely has <clears> the sour, but it actually tastes like a little bit of like a um. And my apologies to any wine mm-hmm. aficionados out there, but it definitely has a little bit of a red wine. I don't know if it's a cab or, you know, whatever, Pinot. I don't know. I'm not that good at wine, but it does definitely has that kind of a wine taste and smell to it. So that's probably mm-hmm. the, the tannic red wine they were talking about, the black cherry, that kind of stuff. Luckily, I don't taste any leather. So that's good. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not that stout taste, but it, it, 
it leans more towards like a red wine. It's actually pretty interesting. No burnt toast. That's what <laughs> concerned me. Yeah, no, no burnt toast. Um, <laughs> I mostly taste the red wine, the black cherry, because it got a little bit of the sourness of a black cherry probably. Um, but yeah, it's actually pretty good. I'm going to give it a 4.5. Wow. <clears throat> Very nice. Solid. Yeah, it's nice. I would not have expected that. So four five, four yeah. nine, and a two three. <laughs> two three. Wow. I'm a little, I'm a little jealous of your beers. <laughs> She's tough. Man, I bet you was your class tough? Yeah. Was it hard to pass your class? <laughs> you didn't grade on a uh, curve, did you? I'll bet. No. Nope. Well, I mean, sometimes you had to. But... Oh. oh, yeah. How long how long did you teach? I taught for five years. Okay. Yeah, high school. What grades? High school. Oh, high school. Yeah, okay. I had all five, all four grades in high school. Wow. Cool. Yeah, it what was your favorite? Trip. Uh, honestly, I had this astronomy class that I taught, and it was tenth through twelfth graders, and they were oh. all the punks. They were all the kids that weren't taking the biology or the chemistry, you know, the higher level, and they would just take a science credit, and they were so much fun. We had a blast in that class. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you'd be taking a field trip this coming week if if you were still in that class, or yeah, for you know, sure, going outside or whatever. So, um, yeah. As we're yeah, as we're recording this uh, on Friday, Monday is the solar eclipse. Uh, I think this will already be out by then. You'll you'll either be blind or didn't see it or whatever. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I I can see like going to astronomy thing and it's going to be easy. But man, there's a lot of math in astronomy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I took it in college and I was like, holy crap, there's a lot of math (laughs) and like big math, like lots of exponential number math stuff. I thought you just went to a planetarium. (laughs) Well, you did until like, until you get a little further in the year, then it's like all of a sudden you're calculating distances and stuff. Oh, okay. It gets, it gets mathy. Yeah. So, which is a little disappointing. I just want to look at the stars. (laughs) Just want to gaze out into the. Yeah, stars and going from the more poet side, not the yeah, math side. That's right. Yeah. So, all right. Well, Rachel, um, we have probably run off at least half the audience by now. <laughs> so that's what we like. We like to have the true believers here when we start talking the good stuff. That's right. And we like to make people press that skip button over and over and over. Um, yes. At least it's interaction of some kind. <clears throat> so, what do we need to know about courses? Like, where do you want to start? Like, why court? Why do I even need a course? Let's start there. Yeah. Why not just sell a widget or an ebook or a, you know, aside from like price, like, why do I need a course? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it really depends on your type of business. If you are a thought leader, someone with really, really big ideas, and you want to go out and change the world and change how companies are doing things, do consulting. Uh, give speeches, then a course can be a really excellent way for you to share your ideas. Um, You know, you might also be some sort of info marketer that is, your product is information, (laughs) is teaching people. And when it really comes down to it, uh, we as humans love to share information with each other. We love to come up with ideas and be like, hey, you know, I have this idea, I have this thing that's gonna improve your life or solve this big problem. So now in this day and age of wonderful Zoom calls and podcasts and all of this stuff, it's just a really natural progression to start having more and more and more online courses. And the whole online course industry is just growing like crazy. It's the fastest growing sector of the entire education industry. And there's a lot of places that businesses can now use it to, uh, you know, it's just easier than ever to set up your own course on your website using some sort of learning management system and get get your ideas out there and make money while you're doing it. Do you have any ideas about like what the the dollar size of the market is? Yeah, actually, I looked up some numbers. So the online learning industry will be worth $687 billion wow. by the year 2030. Mm-hmm. That's according to Global Industry Analyst, Inc. And in 2023, it's estimated that the U.S. generated $74.8 million in online earning, uh, online learning revenue. So those numbers are a little bit uh, 
misleading just because there is, there's a lot of different types of online courses. You could have a academic institution, a college or something that's doing online courses. Right. Then you could have a big corporation that is using online courses to train their employees internally. So rather than hosting big workshops where you have everybody come in or um, it, having experts come in and, and do some sort of in-person training, they set up these online courses to train their employees on just, you know, new standards across the board of how they should be operating or safety standards or things having to do with new legislation that's been passed. Yeah. Um, so that's an aspect of online courses. And then the version that I'm most interested in is the businesses that are selling online courses to external audiences. And they're using that as basically a product that they're yeah. selling to just keep, you know, a step along that customer journey. So whether the course is the ultimate product or the course might be a stepping stone to something bigger that they're, they're selling for their company. So yeah. Coaching or consulting, exciting. right? I mean, Exactly. Ultimately, that's the or, <laughs> that's the next step up. Yeah. Or an event. Yeah. Right. I know one of your clients, Rachel. I don't know if we're dropping names or not, but I know the big one you just finished. They they you might go from there to one of their live events or their elite, you know, whatever their highest level coaching is or that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. If you go on her website, you can see some pictures and you might figure out who her clients are. <laughs> so, dead giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so how, I'm curious, how have, my question is like over the, how have, cause online courses have been around for a long time. Yeah. So how have they, I guess, evolved over time with, you know, people nowadays, their attention spans are at a minimum of what, two seconds now. I've been watching <laughs> stuff because we're all just kind of been programmed on social media and, you know, now it's, it's, um, you know, it's TikTok and all of this stuff. So, you know, attention spans are just so slim today. Yeah. Have courses changed over time to suit attention spans? Um, I know not everybody's the same. And most of the people that I'm probably referring to are the people that probably aren't tuning into courses. <laughs> but uh, a lot of us, I don't, I, I guess even those of us who are ongoing learners have probably have noticed a little dip in our uh, attention span over, uh, the last 10 years with, you know, digital marketing and social media and all of that. Yeah, for sure. So the, the sources I was able to find state that online courses started around the year 2000. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at almost a quarter, uh, century of progression throughout that time. And, you know, I think back to when I got my, my master's degree, I did that through an online, uh, program with Penn State University. And at the time, a lot of the information was just reading. You would get resources, you would get websites, and you would read them. Yeah. And then there would be really clunky discussion forums where you could go in and summarize your, you know, your thoughts about something, <laughs> respond to yeah. your classmates. Uh, you could submit assignments using a really clunky online portal that, yeah. <laughs> you know, where you have yeah. to upload Good luck with that today, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm out. <laughs> it's too much effort. <laughs> Faxing yeah. in your, your homework. <laughs> but, but nowadays, the courses have become a lot more interactive. So, yeah. you know, I think the most obvious thing is just video conferencing is normal for us now. It's yeah. just super convenient and, and natural for us to just get on a forum like this and just talk to each other face to face right. and kind of have that real interaction with other students or with the subject matter expert. And also we have programs like Articulate Storyline, which mm -hmm. is a program that allows you to make animations and interactive slides so that you can have dynamic video, you can have audio lessons, you can have things that your students manipulating and playing around with. And I think the beauty of this with the technology and how it's developed over the years is we're really able to cater to all of the different types of learners because not everybody learns the same way. You have some people who need to see things, you know, some people who need to hear things, and then you have some people who need to hold things in their hands and manipulate them in order to actually get any value out of it. Yeah. Uh, but then beyond that, we also have introverted learners, we have extroverted learners. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, just the way that courses are now, we can have a lot more variety in how information is being presented and what we're asking students to do. So they can just have a really much richer experience just across the board. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Some of those introverts don't like to show up on uh, <laughs> those interactive calls. They're like, ah, oh, just send me the information. I, I'll... Uh... I'll just go through it on my own time. Absolutely. Yeah, I guess the the kinetic learners, right? The they probably miss the three ring ring binder days, right? If they, <laughs> yes. if they were around for those, right? It's like because you had something oh, you could yes. hold and you could flip the pages and you're writing. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of joy in that. I actually think everybody should offer a three ring binder still, like a printed version. Oh mm -hmm. man, um, as an upsell. Now you're bringing back memory, Sean. Dude, I, I'm looking right here. This bookshelf across from my desk is just full of three ring binders. Full of three. Yes. I just absolutely. can't part with them. Like no, I've got, of course not. and then the DVD sets that came with them later. Um, but I've got one that's probably, I've got one in there that's from, I think probably 90, 95. It's probably my oldest course that I've got in there. Um, you know, cause in that 2000, that first decade of two thousands, yeah. A lot of people were still sending three ring binders. Oh yeah, and then the supplemental stuff was online, and yeah. until it, until it finally got cheaper than shipping and printing. So, um, I remember. Do you remember Site Build It? Yeah, you guys remember Site Build It? Like what our first web, the first website I ever built or we ever built. I'm talking my wife and Is I. That McCarthy was that his name? <clears throat> I or don't I remember his name. Yeah, Ken McCarthy, I think. Yeah, that's it, Ken McCarthy. Yeah. Um, it like, I'm talking early two thousands, like yeah. 2002 or something, 2003. He was the original, like direct response online marketing guru. Yeah. Really, yep. I think. Yeah. And his whole course on building <laughs> site build it was like a PDF that you printed out and we had the three ring binder going yeah. through that. My wife printed out every page. It was like five, it felt like 500 pages. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. Yep. So, um, Oh man, I forgot what I was going to ask Rachel. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say that I think you bring an interesting point and I want to make sure we go down this, this trail a little bit. Yeah. Um, one of the most successful coaches I know is, was also, <laughs> and most people don't even realize this about him unless they've really paid attention or they really know his backstory. He was also a PE coach and he had to go through early childhood education, right? Um, yeah. training in college. And you can see that, like, if you don't know it's there, you wouldn't know what to look for. Um, but I remember going to a couple of his events and things like that. And I could see that like show up, like the way he handled the quote classroom and mm -hmm. the people and the interaction, things like that. Tell us how either how you, why that's important. Like some of the stuff you learned in, in your education, um, specifically like education, education and, what most people miss, like if you're just a coach and you don't really have any of that background, you're just throwing a course together. What kind of things are people missing? Yeah. That are just core education principles about, and about delivering a topic and getting students to understand. Yeah. I think that one of the things that people miss is having a structure with definite results, definite outcomes that they want the student to achieve. So when I say outcomes, there's there's two different types of outcomes. You could have a, a straight up learning outcome. And with that, we often talk about something called Bloom's taxonomy. So this is going back to education classes that I took. So basically you have a triangle and there's different levels of learning and okay. I have it posted over here. So I'm gonna read the levels. It starts with remember and then goes to understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. So okay. the idea is uh, as you go higher up, the the triangle you're accessing higher order learning skills so somebody who can understand something or repeat something back has a much less has much less of an understanding of that concept than somebody who can analyze or create or evaluate that same kind of idea so that's a learning outcome and then the other thing is there we go thank you that's, yeah. a, that's an interesting version of it. I've never seen that kind. Uh, that's just the first one that came up on Google. <laughs> For our then, podcast listeners, if you watch our YouTube video, you can see a little chart uh, of it. So. Yeah. 
So besides learning outcomes, there's also competencies. And that's another way of, of thinking about learning. And this is when you are thinking of a particular skill or piece of knowledge that somebody can demonstrate in a real situation. So a competency might be, um, you know, I can analyze the value of this new uh, opportunity within my business and apply it. Or I can build this asset that I'm going to use for my business and apply it. Mm -hmm. So when people are building courses, I think it's important for them to think of those outcomes, think of those goals of what you want your student to actually take away. And that gives you a clear finish line. If you just kind of wander into a course and you don't have a clear finish line of what you want them to <laughs> accomplish yeah. at the end, mm. you're just going to be kind of wandering around blindly in the desert. Um, but instead, if you have something that is very precise and measurable and you know that they either did it or they didn't do it, you're much more likely to have your student actually succeed. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like a lot of people, a lot of coaches, maybe a lot of authors, um, you know, uh, even some of the, you know, make money crowd that is teaching how to do, you know, a certain funnel or a certain, you know, approach. I think a lot of them have an outcome but I'm curious, what are they missing kind of in between, right? So they've sold the idea mm -hmm. with good marketing, good copywriting, good, you know, all that. And they've got a pretty clear outcome. What do you see when you look at people's existing courses? Because you know, they're all kind of the same, right? They're like eight weeks. There's, you know, three or four or, you know, there's, there's a module per week a lot of times, um, you know, and maybe it's broken up into, you know, five or 10 videos because just for you know ease of consumption mm -hmm. but what do you see what else do you see kind of missing in that in that middle part so let's say they have a, a clear outcome what about the intermediate steps because I, I feel like that's where stuff would get lost and could be improved the most yeah i think that my next question would be what are they actually doing to help the student reach those competencies you know let's let's imagine that you have an eight week course that's supposed to help the student up level their business by building all sorts of different assets and, and strategies and putting those into place so that they can just, you know, 10 X their earnings, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear that kind of course all the time. Yeah, of course, um, yep. <laughs> so what are, what are the really practical things that you're having that student do so that they're actually going to have things that are built? They're actually going to have assets they can use. They're actually going to make progress towards that outcome versus just throwing the information at them. I think mm -hmm. you also need to help them apply the information. And, and that's kind of maybe the missing step that I see the most often is just that application and helping them kind of put the pieces together and actually make progress. So what are some examples? Let's say I go through a, you know, module one, I don't have a good example uh, off the top of my head. Yeah. They give me a bunch of information. What kind of stuff should should, well, let's use, what, let's what use a category. Specific. Yeah. Go How ahead. about sales training? Okay. That would be a good one. Yeah. So Jonathan is a sales trainer. Um, he's, he, you know, theoretically, let's say he puts out a course module one is what Jonathan, like, uh, <clears throat> uh, getting or, close, or, or introduction or leads. Yeah. Right. Um, prospecting leads. That okay. would be a good starter. So prospecting leads, he gives them a lot of information. What kind of stuff like you're talking about, whether, you know, what, what are the categories of options? Like if you gave me a, hey, Sean, here's a list of things that they could be doing. What are some of those things? Mm -hmm. Like in high school, I would write an essay. I would dissect a frog, like, right. Like yeah. what are some things in online courses that I could do? So something like write an essay would be for this, you know, you're doing it just for the sake of the course, but now let's think about it. What can you do for the sake of real life? So let's say that in that training, you are trying to help an audience make more sales or get more leads. Mm -hmm. What are the specific techniques that they're going to use? Are they going to reach out to publishers uh, in a particular industry? Are they going to reach out to corporations in a partic particular industry that need uh, a specific type of product? I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is so vague because you know yeah. it just depends on the course. Mm -hmm. But once you have those specific techniques that you're teaching, that's your content, have the students actually do it in real life, have them put together the emails or, or put together the uh, materials that they're going to need to actually reach out and then do it. And 
report back, hey, I sent this this many notes, or I made connections with this many CEOs, or I uh, got this thing launched for my for my website, and look at the results. Now let's talk about those. What can we see in real time, and, and what's actually working, and what's not? Where are the hangups that we're encountering, and how can we overcome them? So I hear you saying that, like, as much as we all hated homework, we should have homework in our courses. Is that what... Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I am. You know, I am. You know, it's funny though. Um, I remember in, you know, learning copywriting and I remember one of the like bad words was learn, ah. right? Or school or things like that. And I think that's changed now. In fact, as far as I know, the learn more button, you have like eight or nine choices on Facebook for ads for the little button and learn more outperforms everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so obviously that's not, not true to not use the word learn. Cause I remember when I started copywriting, like maybe even Dan Kennedy, old school, they were like, don't use the word learn. It reminds people of school and that's bad. Yeah. Um, do you feel like that's still a thing or has, if people buy courses, they're, they're self learners and they're gonna, I mean, what, what have you seen in that from, as you study, like how people go through courses? Yeah. So I don't have a specific thought on using that word with a course, but I I definitely understand what you mean in terms of copywriting, because we always want to use words like unlock the secrets or discover or, you know, reveal like just things that are just much more fascinating. Anything but learn for God's sakes, don't say learn (laughs) or workbook. Yeah. (laughs) Don't use workbook. Yeah. I feel like those days are gone. I feel like people yeah. have kind of gotten past that. And, um, I mean, that's what it is. You're learning, right? It's like, <clears throat> don't be ashamed of it. Like, yeah. You know, um, it seems so- to me that people embrace the idea of being a lifelong learner. Mm-hmm. And especially if you're an entrepreneur or anyone yeah. of that kind of mindset, you already have that tendency to want to have all the information you can, buy all the books you can, do all the webinars you can, just gather everything you can to boost up your business. Yep. I think people who buy courses are like, are, you know, they tend to be lifelong learners. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously everybody buys their first course, but before that they probably bought books and, bef- you know. Well, look probably- at all three of us. Books, yes. books, books. Yeah. All in the background. Yeah. Lots yeah. of books in the background. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's a common trait, you know, for any, for any entrepreneur. Uh, yeah. And probably 400 passwords to different courses on our yeah, last pass exactly. or whatever password software you use. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully you're using one. <laughs> um, so what, what platforms do you recommend today for, people wanting to create courses. Are there any specifics that you recommend for, you know, video based uh, platforms or, or webinar based? Yeah. Well, I think that articulate storyline, if you're building a course that is more detailed and you want to give students that interactive Mm -hmm. uh, experience on a slideshow, I think that's an excellent program. Um, And then what you're going to most likely do is find an LMS, which is a learning management system, and hook that into your website. Okay. Or sometimes you would have uh, a unique URL on on an LMS, and they would just mm-hmm. change the URL so it would have your company name. And I can't so, recommend so one of those. Real, yeah. So you said you can't recommend. Do you have a couple, like, just so people kind of understand the, the category? Is that like school? School's hot right now. And- in the internet marketing world, the marketing world is school a learning management system. Um, I S K O O L. Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. I'd have to. I'm not familiar. I haven't used that one. Um, but my point with the learning management systems is there's so many. There okay. are so many, and I have toured so many of them. And my mm-hmm. honestly, I can't remember half of them because they all are so similar. <laughs> yeah. Right. Teachable, so teachable, like yeah, be one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in that same category. School mm-hmm. also has community. I guess teachable probably does too. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. What do you, I mean, can you talk about what you use? I mean, yeah. Um, the one I've used most recently is called Acorn. Okay. And then another one that I'm exploring is Absorb. Okay. Uh, that one was interesting because it uses more components of AI within the course building uh, platform which I haven't had a chance to experiment with personally, but uh, it, I think has some interesting opportunities there. So 
What was uh, that one? Absorb. Absorb. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Absorb. <laughs> you just like it. It's os- osmosis, right? I mean, <laughs> you just plug in. <laughs> Oh, yeah. There's so many. You can have an yeah. LMS that's going to be very inexpensive. You could pay 20 or 30K mm-hmm. you know, a yeah. month on one. That's really expensive. Wow. It just depends on what that corporate kind of, market, baby. That's yeah. Money is. Crazy. It just depends on what kind of course you're you know, it, in your it, audience. It's, it's so funny because you, know, you can go high end, high dollar on these things. Yeah. But I've got a friend and he's also a client. Um, we've known each other for 15 years. He's in the manufacturing business, retired in the automotive industry. And he started creating these and he is just the old schoolist. I mean, older guy. So he is technologically, I mean, I mean, he's 15 years behind everything. Oh, so yeah. okay. but he just, cre- he creates these courses, um, using some of the most rudimentary type technology. I mean, just records like some webinars and just throws them up on his website and he sells these, he, he does like uh, manufacturing training and he just sells these to companies. <laughs> like, And he, you know, he talks about it. He's like, yeah, I'm making money, more money retire, you know, as in my retirement years than I have when I was working for, for 30 years. Wow. And he just, you know, I helped him along and doing some, uh, you know, some things with his website and getting, getting started. But it's funny how someone who doesn't know anything will just push forward and do some basic things and, you know, using basic technology and just sell it. Like, I mean, for a high dollar and everybody else is just out there kind of like analyzing exactly, you know, all the, you know, learning machines and the AI and what's, what's the right thing to use. And he's just like throwing videos up on a website, like here, (laughs) you can have access to it, but you have to pay me, you know, a thousand thousand dollars per head. So yeah, it's crazy. Rachel, are you familiar with like the, the corporate licensing and some of that stuff? Have you ever, have you done courses? built any courses for kind of that world? No, I haven't. I'm not not familiar with that one. Yeah. I know that's like a high, like a high dollar thing. And I think a lot of people, um, Jonathan, um, Kamanzi talks about this a lot. He talks about, you know, turning your, your courses and your, your materials into stuff for corporations because they pay a lot more, you know, Mm -hmm. you license it to them. Yeah. So, um, so what are some of the must haves, Rachel, in a good course? Like, what are some of the, like, what do we not know that we think we do know? What do we not know that we think we know? Yeah. So what we tools think we, do we need? What, we think, is that what you're asking, Sean? What tools or even do we need? Like the, I, think, I think a lot of people think they know how to do a course, but then Rachel wouldn't have a job if that was true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like you're doing something different. And that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, what are you doing different when a client hires you? And a lot of them already have courses, Yeah. but then you go in and be like, eh, <laughs> your course this sucks. Is, this you're not okay, making any money, but, right? <laughs> um, you know, even a lot of them are selling them, yeah. <clears throat> but what are you doing and going in and changing and tweaking that, that is making a better experience that then leads to a better lifetime value of a, of a client. Sure. So oftentimes a course can be just a step along the journey. So you have them, you know, come into some sort of initial product and then you eventually sell them into a course, but maybe there's something beyond that, that you want them to do, whether it's uh, consulting or if there's another higher level course that you want them to do or some sort of ultimate done for you product that your company's offering. So thinking of that course as a step along the journey and giving your students some curiosity gaps as they're going into it. So you're giving them uh, parts of what the parts of the solution, but you're also revealing to them, there's more to this. This is, this is step one that we're able to cover here, but there's more to this. And that's what, that's, what's going to come later. So I think that when you view your course kind of as a bit of a, a tool for the customer journey and going into that next step and having a strong call to action at the end of your course saying, 
we hope this was valuable. You learned X, Y, and Z. This has been, you know, great stuff. You're going to be able to apply this. You're going to see a difference. You know, we don't want to sell them on empty promises. We, we want to deliver on those promises. But then we also want to think from a psychological standpoint, what's the next step? What's the next thing that they need to learn to be even more successful? Or, or how does this fit into the greater customer journey? So I think that's one of the things that you can do uh, with a course. And also, I love seeing courses go beyond just a video course. I love seeing having that application aspect where you're actually helping the student to solve yeah. real, real world problems within their business or within their lives right. so that they're not just watching five videos and then they're done. You know, <laughs> well, how right. can we take it deeper? How can we elevate the experience yeah. and give right. them real <laughs> solutions? Yeah. So, so how are you doing? Let, let's say it's a small company, you know, maybe they've got, you know, themselves, a small team, maybe five people, maybe, maybe nobody, nobody, maybe they're just a solopreneur. Mm -hmm. They built a course and they want to scale it. But obviously if they, if they say, Hey, here's homework, write your landing page or whatever, you know, like write your, you know, your speaker one sheet, like whatever. Is there a way to, is there a way to scale that with one person or, or do you have to have somebody on the other end, like a, you know, a, a grad student assistant or something like, you know, grading papers, like, how do you, how do you handle that? If you want to make it more interactive, obviously that creates a load on, on the course creator side. Yeah. Are there any tricks or any, to, to help you scale that? Or is it just grunt work and you just got to go through it? Yeah. So it really is going to depend on what kind of experience you're offering. If you are offering sort of that personalized coaching experience where they're going to get to talk to you and get feedback and, and have guidance and, and the opportunity to you know, talk face to face, if you want to scale that, you are going to need more people. And that's when those teaching assistants would come in to play. Um, if you're just one person and you want to scale larger without having extra staff, extra support, then you could throw in aspects of just social media, you know, be able to put your students in contact with each other so that that becomes the larger community mm. and that becomes the sounding board. So yeah. I'm just one subject matter, matter expert. I'm going to be working with a larger group, but now everybody has this forum where they can interact with their fellow students and bounce ideas across from each other. Yeah. yeah and there's obviously like, you know, group calls where you could you could do hot seats and people can kind of learn by watching, mm -hmm. I guess, a review. Is that, is that another tool that you recommend or? Oh yeah, for sure. Those are very effective. Yeah. And people usually I, enjoy them. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think a lot of times that's more effective because when I think people who are not on the hot seat get more out of it than the person on the hot seat, right? Because the person on the hot seat is usually a little bit defensive, a mm -hmm. little bit, overthinking things and they're not hearing everything right because they're yeah. they're just a little nervous or whatever um whereas people who are outside of it, it's not their thing it just they immediately see the problem and like oh yeah i see what the problem is there i could i could change that on mine too yeah um i think that's i mean i think i remember that even from school like i learned <laughs> even when i go to conferences I, I take more notes about my ideas when I go to conferences than I do about what the speaker's saying. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. something about that environment that just triggers mm -hmm. your own creativity. Yep. And I think hot seats and group calls do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I actually had the opposite experience with the recent course that I worked on where students were in that hot seat scenario but the, the people who are watching were having trouble applying mm. the ideas and were having trouble grasping what was happening. And I think it really comes down to whoever is facilitate, facilitating that hot seat experience. They have to be able to relate the person who's on the hot seat, relate their situation to the broader public. Like they ask a question, they get an answer from the person in the hot seat. And now they say to the whole audience, so for those of you who have this experience, think about this. So right. that's going to help them make those connections so that they can have, you know, that. Would you call that facilitation? Yeah. Is that what you, you, yeah. 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 And I think, I think facilitation is a, a skill is an undervalued skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know, I know there's but it also takes pressure off of, of the instructor too. 
mean, yeah, I'm just a facilitator. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love facilitating calls. Like that's, I think that's one of my one of the skills I'm, I have really good at. Um, I'm just here to make sure this thing doesn't go yeah, off the rails. Just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, no, seriously, I've, I've like read, I've, I've led like, you know, Bible study groups and small groups, things like that. Yeah. Mastermind breakouts. And I think one of the keys to that is what you just said, Rachel, like you have to be able to, cause a lot of times the person on the hot seat will just kind of wander and you yeah. have to reel it back in mm -hmm. and then apply it out to the audience. And if you yeah. can do that, then they get ahas. If you don't, then they're just like start checking their text and they start, you know, like zoning out and you've lost them. Um, what are some other tools? I want to try to get practical here. Like what are some other little tools? So let's say a hot seat is a tool. Let's say um, submitting your, you know, a piece of a document is a tool. Mm -hmm. Are there some other tools that, like those are pretty obvious. Are there other tools that you've come across that, that kind of enhance a course? Yeah, you can have uh, virtual lab experiences that students go through where they are uh, actually manipulating things on the computer um, and seeing results of that. My husband actually runs a cybersecurity training company okay. uh, called Cybercraft and they, the oh, students- Oh, that's clever. With a K. <laughs> yeah, with a K. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Uh, and students have the ability to go into a range, basically, where they can, it, the computer acts like another computer that is having some sort of cybersecurity issue, and they can mm. do all of the different inputs and, and, and test it out and get results as if that computer were the console that they're working on. That was a horrible way to explain it, but <laughs> no, I, I like <laughs> that. So, I mean, how did that, that just brings we up. We just remember questions. Cybercraft. That's a pretty <laughs> yeah. cool name. That is a good name. Um, so like, yeah, so that's, that's cool. Let's say I'm a best-selling author and I teach stagecraft, for instance. Okay. <laughs> um, what interactive lab might I have for my students? So if, by stagecraft, I mean the ability to give a good speech on stage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you were doing this, um, it's hard for me to answer this because my client that I recently worked with is the ex exact scenario. I know. That's why um, I asked. <laughs> <laughs> but that particular element of it, the stagecraft was always done in person. They would actually okay. go to the group. Um, campus. But let's say you, you were, you had to, you had to put that into a, to a lab. How would yeah. you do that? Like, I think video, recorded video, and having the students the video. perform some of their speech, um, and then having them submit it, and then having a group call where you're having students analyze things that were happening, uh, or getting feedback on it. But again, in you know, I'm thinking of my particular client, and I know that's not how they would run masterclass yeah. situations. You would you would do live feedback and uh, make changes in real time. So it's a little hard for me to answer that one. Um, but a similar type of class, let's say we're talking about the business of speaking. Um, yeah. In this situation, we can have office hours. It, office hours is a great way where you can <laughs> have smaller groups of students with a business coach who is going to be able to get feedback from the student on how they're understanding the information and the progress that they're making with the assignments. And then you can also have bigger classes. So, you know, when you think about your Zoom class sessions that are live sessions, you don't have to have everybody all at once all the time. You can have a group of 60 people and then you can break into smaller office hour sessions with like 10 or 20 people. So you're giving students kind of that lecture hall feel versus the small section with just your TA. You're, right. you're kind of simulating that. Um, one of the things that we did with the bigger classes for that particular course that I worked on is we did something called deal or no deal, where we were having students uh, come up with a client that they were trying to land and they're having some sort of issue, they're hitting some sort of roadblock uh, with landing that gig or landing that deal. And they talk through 
with the coach, they talk through the process, you know, where are we in the sales process? What are the things that are hiccups along the way? Do we want to pursue this or is this a no deal? Is this not worth, worth our time? So right. just basically things that you would do in a normal classroom, yeah, yeah. In online classroom, I guess that's what I'm trying to get to. Anything that's good practice in person is oftentimes good practice on the computer screen. Yeah, I had a, um, a company I used to work for they, they teach entrepreneurs how to launch a, um, sick, uh, to launch a physical products business. So e-com business, right? Capitalism.com. Um, and then and one thing they would do is for the people in their higher end programs that were trying to get a physical product brand going, they would have a pitch week, like a shark tank, right? Where you would get, yeah. you get like six minutes, you have to make your pitch and you pitch <laughs> it to, and they would bring in some of their friends you know, who were successful entrepreneurs and you literally one night, that was like a, a, like a big culminating event of like this six or eight week course is you got to do your pitch in front of like real people that actually did have money to invest, um, or have been through that themselves. And then you got real world feedback. So yeah. that's kind of a, so stuff like that would, that, that'd be kind of be like a lab or a, you know, a final exam type you know, presentation type feel. Um, I think, I definitely think there's more of that needed and yes, it's more labor intensive, but you can also charge more for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the more interactive, the more you can charge. Yeah. And the more personal feedback you're getting from a coach, the more you can charge versus just a, a video course where you have no sort of actual interaction with the student. Yeah. So, um, can you Let's, create like, <clears throat> just to follow up on that, can you create like different levels? I mean, obviously the content level, do you suggest that? Or, I mean, do you suggest offering the interactive experience, you know, all in one? Or do yeah. you suggest making that an option or an upsell, so to speak? Like, yeah. here's your option. You can, you know, you can take the course, you can get you know, gain the knowledge for this, or if you want the experience of having the interaction, the feedback, um, you know, here's, in, here's another option. Absolutely. Yeah. I've definitely seen that where you have different tiers and yeah. you can even take it a beat uh, one step further. And you can mm -hmm. say you could have the group coaching experience or you could have the personal coaching experience. So yeah. you're a member of the entire class, but on Tuesday afternoon, you get half an hour extra with the coach on a phone call one-on-one. -on -one. So yeah, there's definitely ways to have different levels. And it's interesting that you mentioned the word levels because you can also have different levels of that course mm -hmm. for the students to go through different tracks or learning paths for them yeah. based on what they're prior knowledge is and what their skill level is or what they're trying to get out of the course. So that's another thing to consider. Hmm. Yeah. I could definitely see like, you know, software companies are really good, especially software as a service companies. They're really good at like those charts that like, you know, you got your starter package, it gets this, this, and this, yeah. and then yeah. all the X's and then right. level two is that everything in level one plus this, this, and this, I don't think, I don't think course creators do that enough. Yeah. I, th I think you could, you can really up your average order value by creating tiers of access. Oh, absolutely. And ultimately well, that's to your point, Sean. I mean, you were saying earlier, like, I mean, how much time it's like, you know, how much time do you interact? You know, you offer, you know, you offer the information obviously at a, at a set price, mm -hmm. but obviously if they want to interact with you, if they want more of your time, then I think they should pay a higher, you know, they should pay a premium for that. Yeah. Right. I mean, that should be a premium upsell that, uh, that people, you know, you have, you should have the option, you know, to get the information or you can gain, uh, a more interactive experience. And, you know, if you have questions beyond that for sure, but I think it's, I think it's always I mean, been true in the information marketing world. Yeah. You know, that, the more you pay, you're, you're paying for access to the guru, whoever that exactly. is. Right. And That's right. Some, some, it may start out as group and then it gets, you know, smaller groups and then like one-on-one, -on -one, but you're always paying for access at some, mm -hmm. it's basically what you're paying for. 
Um, That's right. So, um, What's the old saying? No one goes to the uh, bottom of the mountain to see the guru. I mean, you always have to go. <laughs> you, know, you have to go up a few steps, right? Yeah, got to climb a little bit. <laughs> um, so, Rachel, any opinions on as we're going to start wrapping up here? Um, mm-hmm. Do you have a hard stop or anything? Are you you good? Um, no, no kids to pick up or any. Thing like that, or like, I just want to be. I'll take my dog out. That's about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, my dog stared at me like, "Are we ever gonna go back outside?" <laughs> um, evergreen courses versus yeah, like That's good one. Start date courses. Any opinions? Any thoughts? Mm-hmm. Pros and cons. I think they're both they're both valuable. They both have their place. Uh, evergreen is certainly easier. Uh, from the learner's perspective, you do miss that that live element, that interaction with the coach. I don't so think you have to, though. I mean, I think, sorry to cut you off, but yeah, sure. just push back a little bit. So I think somebody who does a course as well as anybody that I've seen in the industry is Rush Rafino. I, I used to, I was on staff there for a while. Yeah. Um, and I think he did a really good, Frank Kern launched in like 2010, 12, he launched this idea of, I don't know if he launched it, but he really made it popular of the eight week course where you release content on Tuesday. And then there's a live call on Thursday. And he always said, it doesn't matter where they are. If they're in week one or week eight, like it doesn't matter. Cause you just answer the questions where they are. And mm-hmm. Russ kind of took that same thing and he added a lot of elements Russ did a really good job of adding the elements you're talking about. Like they give copy feedback when you, they tell you, go write this, send it into our coaches. We'll review it. We'll send back feedback. So he does that really well. And that's, that's why he's a hundred million dollar business now because he's done all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think you can have the live element, even with evergreen, uh-huh. you just have to position it on the front end and let people know. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you're at in the course. We're going to, I actually think in some ways it's better because if I'm in week one and I hear week a week eight person ask a question, I kind of now have my antenna up to be looking out for that problem. Mm-hmm. And vice versa, if I'm in week eight, week one asks a question that I already forgot about. I'm like, oh yeah, I was supposed to, I was supposed to do that thing, right? And I, and I didn't do it yet. So anyway, sorry to. No, I love that. When I think of an evergreen course, I don't think of one that has the live calls like that. So that's Mm -hmm. the model I hadn't really encountered. Um, but I think that's because the leverage, even if you're evergreen, (laughs) yeah. One hour of your week Mm -hmm. or a coach that you hire, like doesn't have to be you, right. If you're the guru, um, it's pretty high leverage, right. To, to be able to add that live element because you can double the price easily, if not triple or quadruple the price, um, by having that, that live element. So anyway, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. yeah um so in ever you know what we mean by evergreen is same course like if we create a course now it's still viable in let's see 2024 is still viable in 2034 right i mean 10 years from now i think of evergreen yeah. is like you can start anytime that's what i mean um, mm, when i say yeah, evergreen okay. well i just think it's from a marketing uh, standpoint um, I mean, some I of it, yeah, the like longevity. if it was a personal development course, then, then yeah, yeah, that would be true. Um, if it's got like some I'm technical creating a, go- uh, a, a golf course, a, a course on improving your, yeah, that would, yeah, uh, golf yeah improving your golf score. Yeah. I mean, that would that's be evergreen. Gonna, right? That's going to be evergreen. That's going to stand the test of time. Absolutely. I think of an evergreen course as you as the creator do the work once and then you yes. never have to do anything for it. Again. Never have to do anything again. Right. Don't touch okay. it. So basket right. weaving. Uh, so there you go. There you go. <laughs> listeners, three different versions of an evergreen. It's, That's right. it's, and it's probably all the three combined actually <laughs> talk about how to lower your handicap. <laughs> yeah, that's, how to lower your golf handicap is going to be viable in 2094. Yeah. Just like it is in 2024. Yep. We'll be dead and gone. Yeah. And somebody will still be trying to lower their golf handicap with a course. That's true. We'll be using light, <laughs> lightsaber clubs by then. It won't even be metal yeah. clubs. Oh, no. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> it, Probably. It'll all be virtual. You'll just be sitting there, so you won't really that's need right. to. Um, okay, so that's evergreen. So so the original question, like kind of back to that, sorry, 
got way off track there, Rachel. That that's just the way we roll on this show. <laughs> We're all over the place. The beer the beer is kicking in. <laughs> Do you remember the question? No. <laughs> <laughs> the question. That's I even, to it. <laughs> that's even better. So like what are some of the differences between an evergreen and a, a start date course that, that you think are important? I think that was the question. Yeah. Um, I would say that a start date course requires more from you, more ongoing work to keep things updated, yeah. to get people enrolled, to get people excited uh, for the course, you know, having that interaction with them. So there probably is a higher cost, back end cost. So it would probably be more expensive, I would imagine. You uh, do get more urgency though, because there's a start yeah. date. Yeah. Yeah. And That's people. Just the upside. People like live experiences. That's yeah. why so many people who never watch football tune, tune in for the Super Bowl because everybody's watching it and they want to be a part of that yeah. live experience with the world. So that's why Hulu's most expensive package is live sports. Mm. Yeah, for right? sure. You, you can watch American Idol a day after, like 24 hours later, but you don't want to watch the, you know, the Sunday football game a day after. No. Right. Because, you know, it's a, it's just a different experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, I think, I think there's a lot of truth <laughs> to that. I think that's why it's important, even in an evergreen course to put some live elements in because it does increase that. I think you, you miss out in evergreen courses, you miss out on the urgency factor. Mm -hmm. Like Marie mm -hmm. Forleo, for example, she has her business school and it launches every year at the same time, the same week. And it's once a year, you either get in or you don't. Mm -hmm. um, scarcity. Yeah. Right. Scarcity. And, and that, you know, you have to be at some level of success, I think, to pull that off as a marketer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people want cash flow throughout the year, not just once, not just one week a year. <laughs> yeah. Um, so until you get to that point, I think you could grow to that. But I think it's hard to do that in the beginning as you're, as you're trying to grow. Mm -hmm. Um. So Rachel, what question have I not asked that I should have asked? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of a witty comeback and it's not coming. <laughs> should have no, had a stronger I'm, beer. I, yeah, I know. It's only 4.5% and I've yeah. only had that much because. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to have to go downstairs and find something different. Um, <laughs> take a shot. find a shot real quick. <laughs> Are there any, <clears throat> I guess uh, my question would be like, in terms of what people are interested in, in 2024 and online courses, are they more in tune to, um, the how to's of, um, technology, um, you know, how to do a certain thing? Or are they trying to, is it more like self-improvement or, I mean, what type of courses do you feel like are, I guess, the more popular today that people are, you know, really intrigued with or still kind of, you know, yeah, in, you know, interested in, you know, purchasing or, you know, spending money on? Yeah, I think self-development is a huge, huge, huge industry. So that's going to yeah. be uh, an enormous one. And then Always. the yeah. other one, I think that is just huge for course design. It's going to be business development. So people yeah. who have their businesses and want to have their businesses be stronger. So those are two particular markets that I think are just booming. Um, let, me, but, let me ask a similar question in a little bit different way. Why are your clients hiring you? right now. Yeah. What are the, what are, what gaps are they seeing? And then you talk to them and they're like, Oh, that's what I need. That's, that's what I was missing. Like, yeah. So I work primarily with thought leaders, including authors, speakers, podcasters, people who have just particular frameworks or ideas or, or conceptual models that they're using to improve the lives of, you know, individuals down at the consumer level or helping companies do better across mm -hmm. the board. So I'm helping those people. Oftentimes they're taking something like a full book that they've written and they want to turn it into a course so that they can just, Perfect. Yeah, yeah. educate That's themselves. That's a great example. 
I've so got how- this book and I'm like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I've sold a few hundred copies, but that's not making me a whole lot of money. Right. Yeah. Right. So how can I, you know, monetize this even more? Well, turn it into a course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just so you know, Rachel, Jonathan has a book about selling while playing golf. It's called selling on the green. Uh-huh. That's right. Okay. He could have a course with that, but he doesn't. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. So, <laughs> so that's why we're talking, to, right? <laughs> you might want to follow up with him later. Um, but yeah, so something like that. So, so you, you tend to work. So tell us, yeah, tell us a little bit how you work, who your ideal customer is, and then you got a freebie for mm-hmm. our listeners. Um, kind of, kind of tell them about that. Yeah, sure. So when I connect with a person, I'm usually looking for someone, like I said, someone who's written a book, someone who has a speech, somebody who is marketing ideas that they want to put out into the world. Um, When we start, we always want to first look at what are the goals of this course? Who is our audience? What are the problems that we're going to solve for that audience so that we we know uh, how to market the course? Because as we know, you know, connecting with your audience, you really have to understand their problem and and who they are inside and out. Once we get that point done, then we're going to start building the structure of the course and figuring out what the shape of it is going to be, how many sessions are there going to be, how many people are we expecting in those sessions, what's the best way to share the information, is it going to be video, is it going to be discussion, is it going to be small groups, is it going to be labs, is it going to be workbooks, but we're not going to call them workbooks, we're going to call them something cool and snazzy. (laughs) So uh, then we want to look at the greater picture. You know, how does that fit into the rest of their business model? How does it help right. advance their overall business goals? So I actually put all of this into kind of a, a roadmap. And I, I just call it the course design roadmap. And it is just a primer to help get those first steps of building a course into your mind. So you can figure out where your knowledge gaps are and figure out what kind of route you're going to take. So if you want to check out my roadmap, I have it for you free. It's on my website and it's crafted online forward slash roadmap. And that's crafted with a K because that's my name. Very cool. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Obviously it's branding. You know? I love it. So Cybercraft, craft, you know, crafting, hey, you know, it's like perfect, perfect last name for that. It's a good last name. Yeah. I, it's I'm a great last well. name. Yeah. <laughs> Craftedonline.com slash roadmap. <laughs> Crafted with a K, craftedonline.com slash roadmap. Um, I can imagine like people you work with who are authors, like you're like, okay, we're going to create this, but we also have to go back to your book and your book's got to be promoting this, right? Yeah. (laughs) So you're going to have to do a little editing there. You're going to have to change. Revised edition. (laughs) <laughs> plus revised editions sell pretty right. well like yeah. if you put revised oh, and updated exactly. for 2024 exactly um, six. yeah <laughs> that's right um kind of what's the, rachel what's the kind of the minute I, I was intrigued when you said a book like that was pretty obvious but you said even something as simple as a speech like if somebody has a keynote speech or a, mm-hmm. a, a regular speech they give you could actually create a course out of that Yeah. So when we're thinking in in that sort of frame, oftentimes when people are giving a keynote speech, they're giving the big ideas. It's almost like a part one of their big concept. So part one is the ideas. They want to transform how people are thinking about something. And then part two is the application. And you can't always do the application aspect of it from the stage. Right. That's when you would have a, a course potentially come come into play or a workshop where you go into a company, into a corporation and you lead their employees through that process. So that's more of an in-person workshop, but it's it's the same, same beast, different name. Um, you know, that's also something that I would do with speakers is help them build that workshop experience with a corporation. Very cool. So does your course design roadmap, does it could it also, like, if I didn't have anything, would it give me some good ideas of what I should build towards? Yeah. Yeah, I think it definitely would. Just a, kind of an overview of the whole process. And and once you see that overview, you kind of figure out where you're starting with Yeah, you know where you're heading and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Well, cool. I'm going to sign up then. Yeah. So let me, let me just go ahead and put in my name here and my email. To all of our listeners, if you're listening, again, craftedonline.com. 
forward slash roadmap. Crafted with a K. Crafted with you a gotta, K. You got to say that part. I'm sorry. <laughs> Crafted with a K. Awesome. My roadmap is my roadmap is loading. It's awesome. Very cool. I love it. Any final words, Rachel, that you want to share with the the wise and eager listeners that we have? Well, it's been an absolute pleasure hanging out with you guys. So I just want to thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. It's yeah, been, we've enjoyed it. It's been good to catch up. We've learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So uh, we have to go. Uh, we have to implement this, Sean. I know. We need to What's your first course, course going to be? <laughs> I know what oh, mine man. is. You know, I know what yours is. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's my problem. I have like too many ideas, so I have to narrow down to one. <laughs> I just have a, I have a iPhone notes tab just full of ideas. I know. I know. Well, you're wrong in the sense that I have too many ideas within my niche and I've got yeah. to narrow that down. So. Yeah. So we'll have to do that. So we'll do We'll both download Rachel's book. <laughs> um, her little freebie. Yeah. We'll go through it. And then maybe on the next episode, we can discuss, you know, some of that stuff. So how to turn selling on the green into a course. Yes. Yeah. I love I like it. it. Love it. I, I want my royalties for the acronym. I came up with <laughs> after the fact, after it was oh, you've already time. helped me swing selling. I mean, yeah. it's like, <laughs> it's awesome. Swing. All, All right. right. Thank you so much, Rachel. We've enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure having you on today. Um, if you want to uh, hang tight in the green room, uh, we'll revisit you after the show. Sean and I are going to kind of close things out, but uh, we've really enjoyed having you on today. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Yep. All right. Good stuff. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. How's that beer for you? <laughs> Did you get to well, two, 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 two down? 12 point something percents. Yeah. I'm feeling pretty oh, good. Wow. I bet you are. Yeah. Go work started, out now. I started the carnivore diet this week. Oof. So I have not had as many carbs. So this one's hitting me pretty heavy. Oh, uh, wow. Today. So I started on Monday. So, awesome, so yeah. Man. Tell yeah. me how that goes. I will. I will. I, I'm, I'm trying I'm, to do my own, uh, my own clean uh, protocol. Not so yeah. much carnivore, but just cutting out a lot of processed stuff out of my yeah. diet. I mean, that's really... I'm actually doing the animal based version from Paul Saldino. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's mostly red meat and then you can still have certain fruits and honey, yeah. mm -hmm. eggs, a two dairy. Um, yep. so it's not like, I think some people call it lion or it's just yeah. red meat. Like I, yeah. I'm not into that. That's just too boring for me. <laughs> Obviously I, I broke the thing with beer today. That's yeah. You know, of course but, you have to, uh, I'm, I've never followed the rules exactly. So right. that's it served me well to not follow the, the <laughs> rules exactly. Um, but yeah, it's me so too far, stringent. I mean, yeah. uh, I mean, there's always a little leeway there. But, yeah. So uh, far it's going pretty good though. It's, um, I can, I can already tell some differences. So good. Pretty cool. But yeah. That was good stuff. And courses, um, I've got a couple of different things and I'll be writing. I'm, I'm in the process of writing, writing some books right now. So courses are definitely part of that so I'll, I'll definitely be following up with rachel here that's great good stuff man all right to we all of our guests, listeners we have any guests coming up i know we have one on the 19th yes or our 19th right yeah um have any other guests coming up or i think so i've thrown out some uh some queries some queries cool we'll see all right we'll keep <laughs> tuning in we're very selective yes on those queries it's hard to get on the show <laughs> We make it hard to get on the show. Yes. Um, but no, you can find us Persuasion by the Pint. Also, want to mention, as you alluded to earlier, we've got the eclipse happening on Monday. So yep. uh, uh, pretty excited. That's, uh, I mean, kind of a once in a lifetime. Well, not once in a lifetime. We've had Twice for me. I was in Knoxville during the last one. Yeah. That's and now cool. I'm in Austin for this one. So I'm in the path of totality twice in my <laughs> lifetime. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Once, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. Without chasing it, like I just live here, so that yeah, that's pretty cool. So yeah, I'll be I'll be going out. To well, the we could have done a whole episode, Sean, on marketing of the eclipse. Oh, but you're not kidding, because <laughs> I know that some hotels and certain locations are making a fortune. They're upselling 
or they're increasing there's, their there's a map somebody put out <laughs> today or yesterday that shows airbnb full <laughs> occupancy across oh, yeah. their site and yeah. it follows exactly the path of the eclipse it's, yeah. it's a it's yes. wild that's right and it's supposed to be cloudy i think in most of the path <laughs> exactly most people won't even see it yep but it's all about the experience exactly as we've talked about the experience yes uh yes all right good stuff man we'll see you next week persuasion by the pint.com you can find us on all of your podcast platforms and uh we look forward to seeing you all next week uh with another guest it's gonna be fun and uh we'll just keep you hanging with that um we won't mention sick or don't show or whatever <laughs> just in case all right have a great weekend take care thanks sean been fun see ya